Blessings in Jesus, dear friends, and welcome back to Hayekadosh Ministries, where holiness is a way of life, and Jesus is truly King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And together with grateful hearts, God's people say, Hallelujah. Well, friends, it is great to be back with you again. We are continuing our study on the road to Calvary. This is book two and part four. Uh, today is titled, Seeing Jesus as the Truth. Now, we have just seen, doubtless with gratitude, that Jesus Christ is made to us all that we need. What then is our first basic need? It is to know the truth about ourselves and about God. Until we do so, we are living in a realm of illusion and we are impervious to the word of grace. It seems largely irrelevant to our case, but the breaking in of the truth about ourselves and about God and the shattering of the illusion in which we have been living is the beginning of revival for the Christian as it is of salvation for the lost. We cannot begin to see the grace of God in the face of Jesus Christ until we have seen the truth about ourselves and given a full answer to all its challenge. This word truth is an important word, especially in the writings of the Apostle John from which much in this chapter will be derived. It is one of his key words, and in his gospel, and three epistles, it occurs no less than 42 times. John puts truth in contrast to the lie, the devil's lie. The devil, he says, abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. John 8.44 This settles for us the meaning of the word as John uses it. It is not truth in the sense of the body of Christian doctrine, but truth in the sense of honesty, reality, a revelation of things as they really are. One of the devil's greatest weapons has always been lying propaganda. It is the way by which he conditions men to disobedience. He wove a web of lies around man in the Garden of Eden, and he has been doing so ever since. He lied to man about his perilous position as a sinner. He said, you shall not surely die in Genesis 3, 4. He said, you're all right. There's nothing to worry about. You can eat of the tree with impunity. He lied also to man about God when he imputed to him certain base motives for his prohibition with regard to the tree. He said in Genesis 3, 5, God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. He also said he does not want you to be a god like himself. He is keeping you down. You see, he flattered man and he maligned God at the same time. And the tragedy was that man believed the lie and acted on it with all the tragic consequences of the fall of man that we know. And the devil is still weaving his web of lies about us today. He is still telling us that we are good people and devoted Christians, and that there is nothing to be concerned about in our lives. He is still telling us that God is not all that holy and uncompromising, or that God does not love us or treats us unfairly. And the tragedy is that we are still believing him. The result is that we have lost sight of things as they really are and are now living in a realm of complete illusion about ourselves. We must not, however, blame only the devil for all of this. He has a ready ally in our hearts. In the first chapter of 1 John, we have the three steps in the building up of this world of illusion about ourselves. The first step is in verse 6, where we have the words, we lie and do not the truth. In other words, we give an impression of ourselves which is not the truth. We act a lie, even if we do not actually tell a lie. Some of us, perhaps, have been doing that for years, play-acting, wearing a mask. And little wonder, for every one that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, 
lest his deeds should be reproved. John 3.20 There is much about ourselves that we want to hide. Well, the next step is in verse 8, where we have the words, We deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. This means that we have acted a lie for so long that we have come to believe our own lie. We begin by deceiving others, and we end by deceiving ourselves. We really do believe now that we are the sort of people we have given ourselves to be. We are quite sure that we have never done anybody any harm, and that we are not jealous or proud as other people are, and that we are truly consecrated to the Lord. The Pharisee who thanked God that he was not as other men were honestly thought he was telling the truth. He was, however, just as covetous, just as unjust, just as adulterous as anybody else. But his own heart had deceived him. He was living in the same realm of illusion as we do. The third step in the process is in verse 10. We make him a liar. All this leads us to the place where when God comes to show us our sin and our real selves, we say automatically, not so, Lord. God, we feel, has made a mistake. He is pointing to the wrong man. Of course, we all admit theoretically we are sinners. But when God comes close, either through a message or through the faithful challenge of a friend, to show us that our hearts are deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, and to do so on specific points, we cannot see that it is right. However, to say that we have not sinned when God says we have is to make him a liar. That is ever the end of this blindness. And when we are there, God can do little further for us. We have become strangers not only to God, but also to ourselves. It is clear then that our first and basic need is to be introduced to ourselves, to know the truth about ourselves as God sees it. It is just here that Jesus Christ has made to us what we need. For he says, I am the truth. John fourteen six. In the soul's experience, this is the first of his great I am's. And our first step is to be willing to see the whole truth about ourselves and the God with whom we have to do as it is revealed in the person of Jesus the Christ. It is important to understand that Jesus is not saying here that he merely teaches us the truth, as if the truth were something apart from himself, but that he himself is the truth. Therefore, truly to see him is to see the truth. If we are asked, where do we see Jesus as the truth? We reply supremely on the cross of Calvary. There in him we see the whole naked truth about sin, about man, and about God with whom he has to do. The very scene that reveals the richest and sweetest grace of God towards man also reveals the starkest truth as to what man is. If grace flows from Calvary, so does truth, for both grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. John 1.17 Let us try to illustrate these things at the point. It is by seeing the concern of the doctor and the extreme measures prescribed that the patient learns for the first time the gravity of the trouble from which he is suffering. It is by the reading of the severe sentence imposed on another man that the undiscovered lawbreaker, who has been doing the same things himself but thinking lightly of them, discovers how seriously the law regards his offenses. It is by seeing the suffering and sorrow undergone by a mother because of his ways that the wayward son comes to judge the true character of those ways. So, in like manner, Jesus says from the cross, See here your own condition by the shame I had to undergo for you. 
If the moment the Holy One took our place and bore our sins, he was condemned of the Father and left derelict in the hour of his sufferings, what must our true condition be to occasion so severe an act of judgment? The Bible says that Jesus was made in the likeness of sinful flesh in Romans 8, 3, which means that he was there as an effigy of us. But if the moment he became that effigy, he had to cry, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? What must God see us to be? It is plain that God was not forsaking the Son as the Son. He was forsaking the Son as us, whose likeness he was wearing. What is done to an effigy is always regarded as done to the one it represents. That derelict figure suffering under the wrath of God is ourselves, at our best as well as at our worst. There for all to see is the naked truth about the whole lot of us, Christian and non-Christian alike. If I cannot read God's estimate of man anywhere else, I can read it there. In very deed, truth, painful and humbling, has come by Jesus Christ, enough to shatter all our vain illusions about ourselves. However, not only has the truth about ourselves come by Jesus Christ, but also the truth about God and his love towards us. Left to ourselves, our guilty consciences only tell us that God is against us, that he is the God with the big stick. We see him only as the one who sets the moral standards for us, most of them impossibly high, and therefore who cannot but censure us when we fail. There is nothing to draw us to a God like that. But the cross of the Lord Jesus exposes the lie to all of this and shows us God as he really is. We see him not charging us with our sins as we would have thought, but charging them to his son for our sakes. You see, we are told in 2 Corinthians 5.19 that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. What we thought was the big stick was really his outstretched arm of love beckoning us back to him. In the face of Jesus Christ marred for us, we see that God is not against the sinner, but for him, that he is not his enemy, but his friend that in Christ he has not set new and unattainable standards, but has come to offer forgiveness, peace, and new life to those who have fallen down on every standard there is. It's important to note here that there has been great misunderstanding when we are told that God loves the sinner. He does love the sinner in the way he offers his love unto the sinner. But the sinner must see himself as he really is and with an outstretched arm reach for Jesus, his only hope of forgiveness. You see, grace and truth has come by Jesus Christ. It not only surprises our guilty consciences, but it melts and draws us, impelling us to return to him in honesty and repentance, knowing that nothing but mercy is waiting for us if we will only reach forth. There are no illustrations of spiritual truth like Old Testament illustrations. The rituals and the history abound within them. Indeed, much of the ritual was instituted only to be an illustration of later New Testament truths. And we must not be thought fanciful in taking up such illustrations and using them for the New Testament itself does so in a number of instances. One such Old Testament illustration which the New Testament uses to show us the Lord Jesus is that contained in the epistle to the Hebrews in chapter 13, verses 11 through 13, which read, The bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned without the camp. Wherefore Jesus also that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. 
Let us go forth, therefore, unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. What would the picture of without the camp mean to the Hebrew Christians to whom the writer of the Hebrews was writing? They would be taken back in imagination to the days when their nation was in the wilderness. They would visualize that great, orderly encampment with the sacred tabernacle in the center of it. Around the well-defined encampment, they would visualize a no-man's land, known to all as outside the camp, and that place would be associated in their minds with certain lower classes of people. Outside the camp was where the foreigners had to live. Those who were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise. Such were not permitted normally to live within the camp. Outside the camp, too, were the lepers. Because of the contagious nature of that terrible disease, they were banished from the camp, uncared for, and excluded from all the delights open to others. It was also the dread place of execution for lawbreakers and criminals. According to the law of Moses, the death penalty was to be imposed on adulterers, Sabbath breakers, idolaters, and murderers by stoning, and outside the camp was where that stoning took place. In this passage, however, the apostle tells us what is perhaps the most gruesome detail of that place. It was the place where the bodies of those beasts whose blood had been sprinkled in the holy place for sin were burnt on the refuse heap. The body which had had symbolically placed upon it the sins of the offerer was burnt as so much sin-cursed refuse, utterly abhorrent to both God and man. Day after day, without the camp, the smoke was going up, and the place was pervaded by the stench of it. In all, that region outside the camp was not a pleasant place. It was the place of foreigners, lepers, criminals, and sin-cursed refuse, a place to be avoided. Yet the scripture tells us that it was the spiritual counterpart of that place outside the camp that the Lord Jesus went forth, bearing his cross, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood. The actual place where he was crucified has a name as gaunt and grim as the associations connected with outside the camp of old, a place of a skull. But the gospel tells us that the place he went to was our place, and how glibly we often say he took my place. But when we consider the place he actually had to take for us, we get a shock. For it is then we see, as perhaps we can in no other way, what our true place is and what our true character is before God. First of all, then, he went for us to the place where he was a stranger, even to his father, the place of God forsakenness. Hanging there on the cross, he cried, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Sin in its beginnings is the sinner forsaking God. But in its ultimate penalty, it is God forsaking the sinner. And that is hell. That was the place to which Jesus went on the cross. The place where God forsook him. And he did so because that was our place. Ours was the curse that he bore. Ours was the hellish God-forsakenness which he endured. The logic of it all is inescapable. If the moment he took our place, God forsook him, what must our true place be before God? What truth shines from Calvary as to our dreadful condition before God? Then, he went forth and took the place for us of a moral leper, as if he were one himself. Indeed, that is inferred in the scripture when it says, We did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Isaiah 53, 4. Hebrew scholars suggest that the word stricken has the meaning of being stricken with the plague of leprosy. All through the Bible, leprosy is an illustration of sin. It is a subtle disease, 
beginning in a small way with only mild symptoms. It ends up, however, as a ravaging monster, rendering the sufferer loathsome to the eye and bringing him to death. Sin, in its inception in our lives, may appear small, but in its culmination it is something utterly loathsome to both God and man, bringing the sinner to eternal separation from God. What contempt there is in the phrase, moral leper, when we refer it to another man. That was just the place the Lord Jesus was willing to take for us, that of a moral leper, loathsome to the eye of God. You ask, why did he take such a low place? The answer is, he did so because he saw us to be just that, and he had to take that place in order to save us. Therefore, Jesus hanging on the cross outside the camp as a moral leper is a declaration of our condition. If we did not know we were one in any other way, we would know it by contemplating the place that Jesus had to take for us. What impurities, what immoralities, and perversions stain so many lives today, yet are so carefully hidden away. But there, it is openly declared on the cross before all men by the very place that Jesus took for us. And although we may think that these things may not have come to fruition in us as they have in others, Calvary declares that they are in us, in essence and in embryo, nonetheless. Then, too, he went to the spiritual counterpart of that place where the criminals were stoned. The Bible tells us in John 18.30, If he were not a malefactor, said the Jews to Pilate, we would not have delivered him up unto thee. Jesus did not die on a bed, about which there is nothing disgraceful. He died on a cross, and a cross was a punishment about which there was a peculiar disgrace, for it was reserved only for the worst of criminals. Indeed, there was a criminal on either side of him, and everybody thought he must be one too. They did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted because of something that he must have done, and they hid, as it were, their faces from him. And the astonishing thing is that he never disabused them. He never said, as we would have said, please, oh please, do not think that I am here for anything I have done. I am here for other people's sins. Instead, he kept silent. He was willing to let them think that he was a criminal. He was willing to be numbered with the transgressors, as we are told in Isaiah 53, 12. And he was willing to die as such, just because he saw that that was our place. And he was willing to take it for us. The Bible certainly tells us that in essence, we are all criminals in God's sight. Whosoever hateth his brother, it says, is a murderer, 1 John 3.15. Anything that is not true love for my brother is hate, and hate is murder. Again we read in Matthew 5.28, Whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her already in his heart. God says that the lustful thought is the same in his sight as the actual deed. But even if the Bible did not say any of these things about us, we would still know they are true, and our guilt would be evident to the world. For at Calvary, that fact is openly declared by Jesus dying for us. Supremely, however, Jesus was led forth without the camp in the same way that the bodies of the sacrificial beasts were taken to be burnt, as so much sin curse refuse. No words can describe the moral depths which Jesus plumbed for us on the cross. It is not too much to say that he was dying there as much sin-cursed refuse, and only because sin-cursed refuse is what we are seen to be in God's sight. There the smoke and stench of our sin went up from his blessed body. You and I may give one another the impression of being earnest, 
godly Christians. But before the cross, we have to admit that we are not that sort of person at all. At Calvary, the naked truth is staring down at us all the time from the cross, challenging us to drop the pose and own the truth. This then is what Calvary shows us to be. These are not just pictures of what we were, but of what we still are apart from him. No matter how long we have been Christians, nor how mature we think we have become, Calvary has something fresh to show us of sin today. For sin is like an octopus. Its tentacles are everywhere. It has a thousand lives and a thousand shapes. And by perpetually changing its shape, it eludes capture. If we are to see sin in all its subtle shapes and forms and prove the power of Jesus to save us from it, we need to pray these words daily. Keep me broken. Keep me watching at the cross where thou hast died. For only there do we know our need as sinners and therefore our need of Jesus. So what is to be our response to all this revelation of truth about ourselves and God? The sort of response that God is asking of us is very different from what one would naturally think, as will be found in John chapter 3, verse 20. The verse begins by saying, Everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. This means that we have sin to hide, and because of that we shun the light. That is everything that would expose the truth of who we really are. Then it goes on to say, But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. We might have thought that if it says, He that does evil hates the light, then it would have gone on to read, He that doeth good cometh to the light. Surely the opposite of doing evil is doing good, but that is not the contrast the Bible uses. What God says is he that doeth truth cometh to the light. The alternative that God presents to our doing evil is not doing good, but doing truth. That is honesty with regard to our evil. He does not want in the first place our efforts to do good where we have done evil, to try to be kind where we have been unkind, to be friendly where we have been critical. We could do all that without any repentance for what has been there already and without any cleansing and peace in our hearts. What God asks first of all is truth. That is plain, truthful repentance and confession of the sin that has been committed and still lies dormant within us. That will take us to the cross of Jesus for pardon, and where necessary, to the other person whom we have wronged to ask his forgiveness as well. In that place of humble truthfulness about ourselves, we shall find peace with God and man. For there we shall find Jesus afresh, and lay hold as never before on his finished work for our sin upon the cross. Simple honesty that is, doing truth about our sins will put us right with God and man through the blood of Christ where all the doing good in the world will not. Let us welcome Jesus today as the truth. Begin with the first thing that he is showing you. It is probably the thing that is on your mind now. The reward of your obedience to light will be more light on further sin. He does not show us ourselves all at once, for we could not bear it. But he does so progressively, as each bit of truth obeyed leads to further revelations of ourselves. The fact that the cross, which declares the painful truth, is already the remedy for sin, will give us a new readiness to respond to its diagnosis. If I know there is an infallible cure for a certain disease, 
I can bear being told that I suffer from that disease. As long as I know there is a fountain for sin and uncleanness, I can face the light about myself and my sin. And the wonderful thing is, is that when we love the Lord Jesus as truth, we will find that he is just as precious in that relationship as he is in any other. It is only our dark, deceitful hearts that make us afraid of him as truth. He wants us to be unafraid of him in this capacity. Nay, he wants us to welcome him in this capacity. He has given us his Holy Spirit, three times called the Spirit of Truth, to guide us into all truth. And we can safely put our hands in his and say, Lord, show me all thou dost see and all thou dost want me to see. I will accept it. I will not defend or argue. If thou dost say it, then I know it is true. Well, friends, that brings us to an end of chapter four. And if you're like me, your heart has been pricked in many ways and your mind has been reminded that Jesus is the only one who can bring the forgiveness that we are in so desperate need of. I pray that through this devotion, through this reading, through this study, that as the Holy Spirit examines your heart, you too will be honest and truthful with what you see within, and that you'll go back to the cross and bow your knee and once again ask the Lord Jesus to wash you clean by the blood that he shed on that great and wonderful day so long ago. Now, as he wills, and until next time, friends, I truly love you, and I'll see you on the next video.